How many love Jesus tonight? Amen. I want you to pay attention tonight. I want you to be here. We want to connect tonight. Amen. We, we come in here tonight to connect with Jesus. Amen. And see, you have to understand that there is nothing like Jesus Christ in being saved. You're going to have to realize that life is going to be like a vapor, but you have to ask yourself, what are you going to do while you're here? Are you going to count the cost? Are you going to lay down your life for, for humanity tonight? And see, you have to understand in Georgetown, Guyana, Pastor Campbell, he's, t he's telling the truth because his life is hard. Life is even hard in, uh, in Chandler. But as me and my wife stepped into this uh, fourth world country, I'm going to call it a fourth world, amen? Because nothing works, the lights click on and off. People are oppressed, people are in sin, people are, uh, are, are living very hard in this nation. But you know what? Our church feels like that we're in the midst of America. We feel like God is there, God is blessing us, God is helping us, amen? Because it's not based on, blessed is not based on what you have. It's based on a right relationship with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. And see, there we've been able to get into a, a hospital in Georgetown, Guyana. Pastor Ortiz, he has sent an impact team in there. Many of those men and women, they were astonished about the living conditions. They were astonished about what was going on, how people were just laying in bed hopeless needing Jesus desperately to do a miracle. I remember that uh, one of the young ladies, she's gotten saved in our church, and, and her sister was having uh, twins. And the doctor told him that, uh, that she's going to have to abort these babies because she had sickle cell. And what was happening, she had to keep going and getting some blood work back and forth. Many times that she was laid up in bed for, many, uh, for a couple of months, I believe. But see, I believe that God was able to do a miracle. We went down there, me and my wife, we went down there, we prayed for this young lady, we led her in a prayer of salvation. And do you know today, about a month ago, these two little baby boy and little girl, they're sitting in the midst of our church and even in our nursery to this day, amen? This is what Jesus is able to do. We serve a God that is a miracle God, amen? Amen. And see, you have to understand these young men, they have a desire like Pastor Campbell has said. Many of these young men, they have nothing, but when they got saved, they realized that they can do something for Jesus. They realize that their life counts, and that can be you in here. I came in here about maybe five or maybe about six or seven years ago, dreadlocks all the way down to my shoulders, walked in with my pants hanging off my butt, Coming in all mean mugging, mad, looking like a big old gorilla, I'm mad. Marriage is all jacked up. And I'm walking down this aisle and I got this big old Bible in my And I said, you know what? My wife said, you need to come here. God can change you. She didn't want to tell me about Pastor Campbell. God, I didn't want no white man to be preaching to me. I wanted a black man to preach to me. But then all of a sudden she says, I got Pastor T's. He's not all black, but he's Puerto Rican, honey. You need to come and see him. So I came in. It was on a Wednesday. I remember I came in broken, but I was high out of my mind. I came walking down this aisle. I heard Pastor Ortiz preaching. He did an altar call, and I still had all this pride and arrogance and bitterness in my heart. And I wanted to raise my hand, and I knew I should have, but it felt like I had a heart attack, and I walked out them doors. But I remember coming back that following Sunday, and I seen Pastor Campbell. And when I walked through the door, he was the first man that I shook his hand. And he looked me in the eye, and it looked like we already had connected, but I didn't know who he was. And I walked all the way down these aisles, and I remember that he began to preach this sermon. When you lost the fire for God, that you can do something for Jesus. God is able to rekindle that fire into your heart. And then all of a sudden, I hit the altars. And I remember speaking in tongues the minute I got saved. But see, here I am, not because of my glory, but because of God. Amen. And we have a vision as a fellowship, and God wants to help us this week. Understand that. 
God is on the prowl. We're in the last days and God is going to pour out his spirit. He has made us a promise if we will just believe and trust in him. Amen. And this is what I'm asking you to be attentive and let us connect. We need a Holy Ghost charge tonight. Amen. So I want you to turn to your Bibles. And I want you to turn to 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 18. And we're going to read down to 25. And I may mess this man's name up, but excuse me tonight. Amen. I'm going to jack it up. It says in verse 18, it says, Gad went that day to David and said to him, Go up, erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor, or Uriah, Arara, excuse me, in the Je Je Jebusite. So David, according to the word of Gad, went up as the Lord had commanded. And then Arara looked and saw the king of his servant coming towards him. So Arara went out and bowed before the king with his face to the ground. And then Arara said, why has my lord the king come to his servant? And David said, to buy the threshing floor from you, to build an altar to the Lord, that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. Now Arara said to David, let my lord the king take and offer up whatever seems good to him. Look here are the oxen for burnt, uh, excuse me, for burnt sacrifice and threshing implements and the ox, the yoke of the ox for wood. Verse 24, all of these old king Arara has given to the king and, and Arara said to the king, may the Lord your God accept you. And then the king said to Arara, no, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. Listen very carefully. Nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, which that which costs me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord heeded the prayers for the land and the plague was withdrawn from Israel. Let us play tonight, church. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, God. God, I thank you, God, for this wonderful opportunity, God, to stand here, God, in your holy name. I thank you, God, for every precious soul, every man and woman, every disciple, every pastor, every pastor's wife, and every missionary couple in this place. God, I pray right now, God, you begin to pour out vision, God. Begin to pour out favor, God. Let us, God, begin to connect, God, in heaven tonight. Help us, Lord. God, we desperately need you, God, to move by the Holy Spirit. God, let all the glory be to your name and all God's people said. Amen. I want to talk about the history of a threshing floor. And see, I've entitled my sermon, The Purchase Tonight. And see, I want to give you a little history about the nature of the, uh, in the natural sense on the threshing floor that Middle Easterns and even in biblical times, and what they did was they welcomed a, a, a site of the threshing floor as a resting place. It was this hard, it was this flat surface, it was even a level spot. It was much preferable place for their tents to be set up rather than using the stony areas in the field. And see, they were most important for agricultural purposes. And see, on this threshing floor, wheat is threshed until the grain falls out. And they would toss this grain into the air to separate the wheat from the cloth. And see, allowing the wind to blow the light husk apart and leaving the heavier grain behind. And see, this threshing floor were also used for pagan images. And see, rituals were often referred as to, they do these high, these, uh, they call them high places. And this is where demonic activity was. And see, these pagans built these shrines to worship their pagan gods. And see, this form of worship was forbidden for the children of Israel. But see, God sometimes, he used his people to go there by his approval and worship on this high elevated place and build an altar to the Lord. And see, you see, King Solomon, many of us know that. 
This is where King Solomon had a dream, and he asked God for wisdom and knowledge on a high place. But see, now I want to look into the spiritual sense, because the threshing floor plays a big role in God's plan for salvation and for humanity. Beginning with the sacrifice of Isaac, ending with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the true church of the living God. And see, the threshing for is where God meets and deals with his people. He also is where God has cut a covenant with man and even his people in this time and hour. And see, we're in this conference is because we are called to covenant tonight. And see, God had made a blood covenant with this fellowship tonight. And you have to understand the power and dominion that you have as a church tonight. But see, you have to understand, I want to back up a little bit. Because in 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 1 through 17, We read about King David. Many of us know that King David was a man after God's own heart. But see, David had become proud in his victory and in his success in uniting the 12 tribes of Israel into one kingdom. But see, not soon after, here comes Satan beginning to intervene and beginning, to, and it was recorded in First Chronicles 21, 1, he tempts David in the joy of his victory. And see, now Satan stands up against Israel, and it says right here he moved or he enticed David to number Israel. And see, right here, listen to me very carefully. See, right here is where we really need to be aware of Satan's temptation. Countless Christians have fallen in the trap of temptation. It's because they have laid aside their armor tonight. And see, you have to understand, this is why many men and women are entangled or even caught up in a foothold. It's because we have these victories and then Satan comes right in and sneaks us right under. But see, this is what happened to David. And see, God had good reasons to be upset to David for numbering these, uh, this army, his army tonight. See, I believe that God was angry because dad, not because David, listen to me, had taken a number of the army, but David took it out of pride tonight. And see, we know that God judges pride as sin. How many know that? And see, because of it, God sent this major epic out, a plague, to punish David's uh, disobedience. It says in verse 15 in our text, So the Lord sent a plague upon Israel from the morning until appointed time. Then Dan to uh, uh, Beersheba, Beersheba, 70,000 men of the people died. And see, a plague is an affliction sent by God as a punishment of sin and disobedience. So you have to be very careful when we live in sin and disobedience, we release a plague of God's judgment into our lives. We can release this spirit or, excuse me, God's judgment into our home. It can be released into your ministry, disciple, if you're not careful. And see, this is what David did. It began to destroy and deteriorate his life. But not only that, it was innocent bystanders standing in the way and caused them to go down all because of what David had done. See, pride is not simple, this simple thing in the eyes of God. How many know that? Because it killed 70,000. We have proof here. We have evidence. And see, what, what God hates about pride, you know why God hates pride so much? It's because you take on the nature of Satan when we allow pride to enter our hearts. We begin to become like his character. We become has this attitude on us. And we become even almost like Satan himself. But see, pride, you know what pride does? Pride makes you think that you're somebody who you're really not. And this is why God hates it so much. But see, you have to understand, when God builds you, it is by a supernatural power tonight. And see, just like God built David's kingdom, 
It wasn't by David's strength or David's ability the whole time. It was also God's anointing on his life this whole time. And so you have to be very careful, young man, young disciple, or even pastors at this time. It's because God can begin to do a miracle, an divine increase in your ministry, and we can easily begin to allow this to think that we have started this or caused this great revival. See, the Bible says it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. It's not by my might as Pastor Mikhail Baldwin. It is by his spirit. It is what's doing this great work in Georgetown, Guyana. And see, so you have to understand, God is giving us a warning sign about pride that we cannot forget where we've come from and what God is doing in our lives tonight. What God is doing through all of these flags across the world. In this church, it is understanding that it is Jesus is the one doing this tonight. By his spirit. Oh, we are as weak, innocent, helpless vessels God wants to use. But see, about how this is, but see, you have to understand. Many men are looking at how many I have. They're looking at how many converts I can get. How many churches I will be able to build one day. Or even talking about climbing the ladder in ministry. And see, I'm dealing with this same thing with the disciples and people in the church. But see, what is happening is people are not getting saved and they're not getting converted because all they're looking at is stature and numbers. All they're doing is trying to be eye service instead of nurturing the sheep, looking out for the sheep and attending to God's people. See, you have to understand, when I got saved and got out of that jail cell, God did a work in my heart. I hated people. I despised people. It didn't matter. It was all about me. But I knew there was a supernatural dimension that had twisted my heart and began to make me yearn and cry for people. And see, you have to understand, when I come in Chandler, I understood when I began to witness a Keith and Darian and all of these young men. It was not me. Don't get it twisted tonight. I'm standing in, a, a, in the concert last night. And a young man, he rose up to me and I love him. But he says, you look like a celebrity. And I said, it ain't me in here doing this. It is Jesus. I'm not going to take any of God's glory. I'm nothing but an ex-con, four-time felon, sold crack cocaine, fates in 18 years of prison. It is not by me, but it's by the hand of God. I'm only standing here by His grace tonight. So you have to understand that if you release some type of plague into your life, some type of punishment, Either it can be some sin or some disobedience. Whatever it is, you may be reaping the repercussions. You may be feeling it tonight. But see, I'm going to tell you this week that we serve a God that is a God of second chances tonight. But see, God says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5, He says, My son, do not despise the chasing of my, my Lord, nor be discouraged when they are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scorns every son whom he receives. The, the scripture is telling us that God loves you if he's punishing you tonight. God is trying to waken you up, young man. When you start seeing things are killing your ministry, you're barren. You have to go back and check and say, where did I number the people, God? Where did it all come crashing down? But see, the Bible says, and the scripture says in verse 16, God relented. What he said was, what this is meaning is God changed his mind of destruction. He had compassion on David. He had mercy on David. Even when we mess up and step out, we have the same benefits tonight. Amen? But see, I want to talk about the cost. Because the threshing floor in our text was located in Mount Moriah. If you studied out on your own. 
And what it means was, in the Hebrew, it means visible from far off or mountain of mare. And what this was, was this is a picture of God's presence. And Moriah means Jehovah provides. And see, for a thousand years, I want to break it down. This mountain has been the most disputed threshing floor in the world. It has been in Jerusalem's Temple Mount on, on Mount Moriah. And see, it's even known in Hebrew, mountain of the house of the Lord. Even in Arab, it means no, a noble sanctuary. And see, God himself chose this place. He sent Abraham to take his son Isaac up there to be sacrificed. You can read it on your own through Genesis chapter 22. But see, this is where we become in relationship with God because of one man's choice of faith and obedience to believe God. And many of you in here and all of us are heirs of Abraham's faith tonight. See, this is where God made covenant with this man. And see, one thing continues to blow my mind is many scholars believe that Calvary was located on a section of Mount Moriah. You see, it's an amazing thing that the crucifixion of Jesus took place somewhere on part of this mountain. This is where God offered up his son, Jesus for our sins tonight. He made the real sacrifice tonight so you and I can have salvation in here, church. But what's so interesting is, Pastor Campbell's been there, but these are three, these, these places in the Holy Land, they were not conquered by war by the Jewish people, but they were purchased, listen to me, according to the law of the lands, and these were places that the Muslim want to take from the Jews. And see, today, the Muslim temple sits right on this mountain. And it's marking it the third holiest place in Islam tonight. And see, even though history proves that both of these sacred places, Jews stood, the Jewish temple stood there on this place first. And see, neither Jew or nor Christian are permitted to pray here. But see, on the spiritual side, listen to me, we can see this mountain or this threshing floor symbolizes a struggle between Isaac and Ishmael, which is this ultimate struggle between the flesh and the spirit. Can I talk to you tonight? And see, Israel is fighting for the Jews for their holy land. But see, listen, hell will always try to take and conquer those holy places that you purchased, that I purchased, and paid a price for tonight. Just like he's trying, just like the Muslims are trying to do to these holy lands. See, listen, hell is fighting for your salvation. If you have not understood that. Hell is fighting for your calling. He is fighting for many of your marriages. Listen to me. A marriage is a covenant between man and woman, but God is approved of it, and God is telling you tonight, fight for your marriage, fight for your husband, fight for your wife tonight. <laughs> Hell is fighting for this church, fighting for this fellowship. But see, it wasn't until David cried out and, and asked God to have mercy. God put the judgment on me for my disobedience. He says in 17, he says, And then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people said, Surely I have sinned and I have done wickedly, but these sheep have done nothing. David understood that he is going to have to have a heart for the sheep again, for God to stop the plagues tonight. Have you lost your heart for the nations? Have you lost your heart for your family? Have you written them off and it's become too difficult and frustrated? But see, God is telling you you're going to have to pray for them and believe for them that he can do all things tonight. I want to talk about the power of the altar. How many know that altar is very powerful? See, this prophet Gad comes with the word of God, when the word of, uh, word of the Lord, and tells David, David, you need to erect an altar. 
You need to present sacrifices for the atonement of sin. And you need to do this to stop the plague in the children of Israel. This is true in our lives if you want things to change. You're going to have to erect an altar, but it's going to cost you tonight. Am I talking to somebody? This does not come free. If you want God to stop the plague and carnality and flesh and sin from corrupting and eating up everything in your life, you must erect an altar tonight. You're going to have to build it. See, being a Christian and just saying I'm a Christian, it's going to cost you tonight. Many of us realize that. If you're going to be a disciple, it's going to cost you. You're going to have to pay a price because Jesus says in Matthew 16, 24, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You're going to have to pay a price for your faith. You're going to have to, if you want hell to stop tempting you and making your life a living hell, you need to ask God yourself, are you truly a Christian tonight if nothing is going on in your life? If you're not being tempted, listen to me. I'm tired of these Christians crying. I got them in Guyana. They come, pastor. I ain't got no bus fare, pastor. Pastor, I say, you know what? If you're going to be a Christian, do not expect this to be an easy road. You're going to have to fight. You're going to have to believe that God is able to give you a job. God is able to supply food on the table. And see, you have to understand, in America, we're big, we're heavy, because all the food we eat. I went over to Guyana, and I lost about 30 pounds because I'm starving. <laughs> I come back and I look at somebody, I say, whoa, what'd you eat? I look at somebody, I say, hey, did you eat the baby? <laughs> but listen to me. Listen to me. If there is no cost, there is no real sacrifice. See, God created everything. Listen to me. God created the heavens, the earth, the mountains, the birth. But you know what? One thing he purchased was the church tonight. This is the only thing that God purchased. He created everything else. It costs him his only son tonight to purchase this church. Grasp that tonight. See, Jesus paid this ultimate price for his life. These disciples, many of you read, they were uh, beheaded, they were crucified, they paid a price, and David paid 50 shackles of silver. But see, Pastor Campbell, let me talk in others in this church. I wonder if they, Pastor Campbell did not, him and Connie did not pay the price. I wonder where we'll be as a church today. Can I be real? I wonder if I'm even be up here preaching and talking. I wonder if me and my wife will still even be married tonight. He paid a price. Listen to me. He cut a covenant in Miles, Illinois. Listen to me. This was, what, 35-something plus years? And here it is because of one man. He stopped the plague of all of us sitting in here tonight. Because he purchased a threshing floor. And he erected an altar. This is why I was able to come down here. Say a simple prayer, but the fire of God came down. Broke chains and bondage and addiction off my life because of a man willing to count the cost. I wonder if Connie said, Joe, you ain't going to have me living up in no attic. No, no, no. No, 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 Joe. <laughs> well, okay, Connie, how about, the, how about the Sunday school? No, 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 Joe. Am I talking to somebody? But see, what price are you willing to pay? What price are you unwilling to pay? See, you can be in here and you paid the price, you paid your dues. 
But are you still paying the price, old saint? Are you still willing to lay down your life? Because you know what? I ask myself these same questions. I'm telling you, listen to me. I love Jesus and I love people. And I begin to plateau in my relationship. And you know what? God began to say, you're going to have to sacrifice if you're going to go any higher with me. You're going to have to, it's going to cost you. Here I was saying, okay, God, if you will take me to the nations, God, I will go. I begin to lay down the barbershop on the altar. I begin to take my cars and my house, all that I had accumulated. And you know what? Fire came down, and here we are in Georgetown, Guyana. We have doubled. We're in hospitals preaching. We have doors open favor with the police. I even can go anywhere I want, and they say, do whatever you want. We need you. This is what God is talking about. Paying the price tonight. But see, you have to understand, listen to me. Your stability is not going to be in this government or in this world. They're unstable. See, listen, the only stability in life is Christ. The Bible says he is the rock. He is a solid foundation. The anchor of our hope. Where is your hope at? What happens when they begin to come and persecute Christians? Like Ron Myers said, what's going to keep you from taking the mark tonight? See, many of you better be careful if you're not sacrificing tonight, not counting the cost, because you've already taken the mark in your heart. Can I talk to you tonight? Can I be real? What you going to do? If you're not willing to pay the price. But see, David, listen to me. Here's this Jebusite, this nasty enemy. Devil. I, I like the picture of the devil. He says, I will give it to you like free of charge. David says, no, 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 no. It's going to have to cost me. I'm going to have to feel. I'm going to have to see God if I want him to come down. He says right here in verse 24, no, but I will surely buy it for you for a price, nor will I sacrifice burnt offerings to the Lord, my God, which that costs me nothing. Are you looking for someone to build your altar? Instead of you building your own. What about you, disciple? Are you expecting Pastor Campbell to give you his altar? What about you say, mom, dad, teenager, what about you tonight? See, listen, it is always true that building anything worth value will always cost you something. If you want a relationship with Jesus, it's going to cost you. Disciple, if you want an anointing ministry, it's going to cost you. I remember calling Pastor Campbell. He don't even realize, but he calls me. My mind is all twisted. You know how many missionaries are. Mind is all twisted. I'm going through these demonic assaults. I didn't have a, a, a culture shot. I mean, had an outer body experience. I'm yelling into, in the post office. They didn't mess my flyers up. I'm acting crazy. I'm, 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 I'm a foaming at the mouth. I'm banging on the account. Hey, hey, hey. But you know what? You know what, my pastor, I love my pastor. I'm telling you, I love my pastor. I love his wife. But you know what, when I called him, I'm saying, Pastor, my mind, my mind. And you know what he said? He says, you know what, Mikhail? They can take your business. They can take your car. They can take everything. But they cannot take your ministry. That's what you need to focus on tonight. You can be stripped. We see it right now. 401k made off and ripped off everybody. And you know what? They have painted this perfect portrait of saying this is security. But Jesus is telling us if you will lay down your life, they cannot take what I've put in you.
So you're going to have to settle in your heart. Listen to me. Make up your mind now. Stop being wishy-washy on the ladder. If you're going to preach the gospel, pay the price. Get up the prayer. Hit outreach. Serve your pastor. Put your children and kids in line. If you're going to stay saved, make up your mind. Stop going to the clubs. Stop making these stupid mistakes when you know they're wrong. Serve God. Settle in your heart tonight. See, you have to understand, this is why the religious world has removed the altar. Because they don't want to purchase it and pay the price. They don't want to have to take the persecution. They don't want to have to take the assaults tonight. But see, when you purchase this threshing floor, your reputation is going to be on the line. I've seen the internet, little things that Ron Myers was talking about. Sitting there persecuting, but you know what? The Bible says when they did that in Exodus to the children of Israel, the Bible says he multiplied them. They begin to increase right before their enemy's eyes. And if you're being persecuted tonight, God is going to multiply you tonight. Can I talk to you? See, this is why people are not converted. It's because they're not having the altar. They're not living for God. They don't want to sacrifice. They refuse to build an altar tonight. And see, this is a reason why we're all saved tonight, because we built an altar. As in fellowship, our Pastor Mitchell, I don't even, I've never talked to Pastor Mitchell, I shake his hand. But you know what? I understand what this man has done. I'm serious. When you shake his hand, it's like he can make you feel unclean. <laughs> He's that, I mean, he's that close to God. But you know what? I said, this man has paid a price. My pastor, and I don't take that lightly. I'm not going to be a burden to my pastor. Are you understanding me? I will never try to be a burden to my pastor. I understand what he has paid and what he goes through. You have to understand that as a man of God. And if you will grow up, many of you young men, and understand, stop being a burden and be a blessing to your pastor. But see, you have to understand, if you purchase this threshing floor, you have to know the power of the altar. Listen to me, disciples. It ain't all about your preaching because I preached some sermons and I said, my God. I'm about to go home and pack up. My wife said, what was that? <laughs> I even let her read a couple of my sermons. I said, oh, well, honey, I've been studying, honey. I've been getting it. Read this, honey. She says, my God, what is that? Then you know what? I said, you know what? I believe God. God knows where I'm at. <laughs> But it wasn't going to be my by my persuasive words or how I talk. I'm, you know, you know me. I'm from the streets. I'm from the hood, South Phoenix. But you know what? God comes down in our services because we're willing to purchase the altar tonight. People's sin is coming off. Fornication is being ripped off their life addictions and bondages. Listen to me, men, these young men come in, they only got one pair of shoes, holes in them, pants way up, and they come in and God puts vision in these men. They're at prayer at six o'clock every morning. Clean up the church at outreach because you know why? It was God's divine dream deposited into their heart. This is what the altar does. You tired of hell beating you up. You tired of struggling in alcohol and whatever. Come to the altar and meet Jesus tonight. Come and pray for our fellowship. We're in the last days and I believe our fellowship is going to be the key to the end times. Can I talk to somebody tonight? It's because we're willing to purchase a threshing for tonight. This is what Jesus is talking about. This is what God does. He cut a covenant. Listen to me. God is looking to raise up 
Moses and David's in this generation. He's always looking for his man tonight. Can I tell you? God searches. He said to Ezekiel, there was none there to stand in the gap. God is looking for you tonight. He wants you to stand in the gap. You have to understand this is the great commission. This is what God has told us to do. We're not building God's church. He says make disciples. Discipleship is going to build God's church tonight. If you want to do anything for God, be a disciple. Be a learner, a student, a follower of the gospel tonight. Amen? See, many of you feel like being Bible study leaders and, and song survey, leaders, but you're going to have to show yourself approved. Can I talk to you tonight? You have to understand if you're going to be a people of leaders of a slave mentality like the children of Israel, see, God is going to teach you how to lead when you go through the wilderness experiences of life. This is where God, this is where you learn how to be successful is when you're on the bottom. Can I talk to you? This word Hebrew, listen to me. Desert, it comes from a verb which means to speak. And see, if you're in the wilderness place, listen to me. This conference is the best place for you to be tonight. You may be in the desert place tonight, but I'm going to encourage you and don't give up. Don't get discouraged. Don't quit fighting tonight. Pray and ask God, what should you do tonight? This is what Ron was saying, Pastor Meyer. I don't want to just have these old legacies of what God's doing. I need to have a refreshing of his revelation. Amen. I got to see dead bodies resurrect because that's what the altar does. It quickens the dead. It quickens your mind tonight. Quickens your calling tonight. But see, it's all because of the work of the flesh tonight. You're going to have to let God kill it. Do you know the Bible says and I'm getting ready to close. The Bible says that a man used Obed Eden, his son. They had the ark covenant in the house, and he's walking. And they've taken it out. David can't win. He wants to bring the altar back. And what happened was they carried the altar on an oxen wagon. And what happened was priests were only supposed to carry this altar. But they, I mean, excuse me, the, uh, uh, the uh, Ark Covenant. But they were supposed to carry it on some poles. And see what Yuza did. Listen to me very careful, Chandler. Yuza became comfortable and touched the altar because you know why? The Bible says it was in his house, and he became too comfortable. He became too loose, and he touched that altar past the threshing floor, and he died. That's a picture of the man of the flesh, if you would get in the threshing floor tonight. See, God wants to help us. God wants to raise up men. God wants to fill these flags in many of our churches and even in this church tonight. But it's going to have to be a price. You're going to have to continue to purchase it. Can I talk to you? Believe God. Believe God for big things. We serve a God that is big and we're people in God that is big tonight. We little people. But see, the strength does not come in numbers. It comes by his spirit. And this is supposed to be a spirit-filled church tonight. Can I talk to you? We're supposed to be Pentecostals, radical, turning the world upside down, going in your job and making a stand as a Christian. I refuse to listen to your gestures of nasty jokes. Get behind me. I'm saved and born, born again tonight. But it's going to take us as a church, as one accord tonight. Amen. And it's, I'm telling you, many of you need God to rekindle that fire inside you. You need to be like Jeremiah, that you is so burning in you that you cannot shut it up. You have to say something. It compels you. This is what God is saying. This is the covenant that he made on Calvary. This is what the Muslims are trying to take and destroy the Jews 
But this is a picture of us in the spiritual realm. Amen. God has made a promise to us and we'll keep ours. Stand on our promises. Stay faithful. Listen to me. The Bible says Jesus set in his face like a flint towards Jerusalem. This is a picture of us setting our face and our minds towards heaven. Engage tonight. Don't look to the right or the left. Pray for your family. Pray for new converts. Pray for your pastor and his wife that they have the mind of God. And pray that God will open nations that desperately need the gospel. Prayer is powerful. Pastor always said, Mikhail, you will never rise above your prayer life. I realized that when I put that in my training and in Guyana, I pray constantly. I'm fasting. And you know what? It is keeping me there to do the will of God. And it's all because of your prayers too. I feel you praying for us. When I get discouraged, I feel channeled. I can feel this, this wind is going, it's okay. We got you. We got you. But it's going to cost you, amen? Nothing comes free. Understand, if you want anything valued and worth something, it's going to cost you tonight, amen? Purchase the threshing floor build an altar. If your altar is destroyed, God is in the pairing altars tonight. Amen. I want every head bowed and every eye closed. Oh, God, we love your name. God, blessed be your name.